Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First UMC of Hammond. My name is Chris. I'm the pastor here. Welcome to our virtual sanctuary on Zoom and Facebook, wherever you happen to be. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning. I hope you all had a very restful, peaceful, uh, hope-filled, quiet, safe Christmas Day and all of the reverie that continues through to this day. Again, I am so glad you're here. If you are joining us online, would you do me a quick favor and hit the like and share buttons, especially on Facebook. That helps us get this into as many eyeballs and onto as many devices as possible. So we greatly appreciate your help with that. Uh, there's not really much in the way of announcements right now. It's sort of coming to the end of the year and uh, Really, we're all just getting ready to go in for a bit of a hibernative state as uh, winter sets in and we do that naturally and uh, all of the other reasons that we have to do that sort of thing. But uh, no matter what's going on outside of this space virtually or where we are here right now, uh, we are here to worship God and I am so glad you've joined us. Uh, the December extra mile giving, I'm sorry, second mile giving, excuse me, uh, is uh, the Clean Water Project in Burkina Faso and Bishop Trimble's Christmas offering for children. If you st there's still time to give to those efforts, uh, please uh, reach out to the church office for information on how to do that. Um, I believe that is uh, all for uh, announcements this morning. So we will begin as we begin every morning. I'm sorry, no, it's not because we have a special guest this morning. Kathy Smith is joining us for an announcement. I'm so glad that I didn't steamroll over her and I remembered. Good morning. Um, this morning, I'd like to make a few comments on behalf of the entire congregation. And I'm going to ask Pastor Brad to join me at the side of the altar here. Right there. As you all know, today is Pastor Brad's last Sunday at First United Methodist Church. He has been appointed as a local pastor at two churches in Southern Indiana, and those appointments begin in January. Pastor Brad came to us in August of this year as a student pastor, and he has been serving under the guidance of Pastor Chris. Pastor Brad, during that time, has led us in scripture, prayer, Bible study, daily devotions, and given us sermons. He has showed and shared his love of Jesus and also shared some awesome recipes. We are excited for the things that God has planned for you. And we thank God for bringing you to First Church to begin your ministry. Know that the prayers of this congregation will be with you when you start your appointment and that we ask God's blessing on your ministry. Thank you so much. Thank you. He may or may not have at least one more of those coming before the end of the day, but uh, we'll wait until after he preaches for that. Uh, we will begin then as we begin each morning together with our call and response where I say, Oh Lord, open our lips and you respond and we shall declare your praise. Are you ready? Oh Lord, open our lips and we shall declare your praise. Oh Lord, open our lips and we shall declare your praise. Oh Lord, open our lips and we shall shall declare your praise. Now let's join together and sing hymn 240, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. 
Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased with us in flesh to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the hand-born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that we no more may die. Born to raise us from the earth, born to give a second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Would you join me in prayer, most gracious and holy God, it is our honor and privilege, privilege to come before you once again to sit at your feet and in the wake of a Christmas unlike any we have seen in our lifetimes. Father, we come to you grateful for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Keep us mindful and humble in the face of them. Father, we pray for those for whom this day is another difficult day of just surviving. Help us to be so moved as to move the world to step in for them as Christ teaches us. Father, be with us in this time of worship. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Children's Time message. This time it is a blustery afternoon out here. One of the beautiful parks out here in Hammond. And we are just enjoying the day out here. Yeah, you know, a member of a certain church who before had been attending services regularly stopped going. After a few weeks, the pastor decided to visit him. It was a chilly evening, kind of cold. The pastor found a man at home alone sitting before a blazing fire. Guessing the reason for his pastor's visit, the man welcomed him, led him to a big chair near the fireplace, and waited. The pastor made himself comfortable, but said nothing. In the complete silence, he watched the play of the flames around the burning logs. After some minutes, the pastor took the fire tongs, carefully picked up a brightly burning ember, piece of wood that's burning and placed it to one side safely all alone then he sat back in his chair still silent the host watched all of this in quiet wonder as one of the lone embers flame went out there was a bit of a glow and then its fire was no more soon it was cold and well dead as a doorknob as they would say not a word had been spoken since the pastor came to visit. 
just before the pastor was ready to leave, he picked up the cold, dead piece of wood and placed it back in the middle of the fire. Immediately, it began to glow once more with the light and warmth of the burning coals around it. As the pastor reached the door to leave, the man said, thank you so much for your visit and especially for the fiery sermon. I shall be back. Hmm, that's a pretty interesting story, wasn't it? You know, this kind of reminds me of three parable, parables, three parables, you know, Jesus taught. All three make up the entire chapter of Luke 15. In the parable of the lost sheep, one of the hundred sheep um, the shepherd was watching wandered away. The shepherd walked away looking for the lost sheep, leaving the 99 others behind. Once he found it, he laid the sheep on his shoulder and brought him back um, to be with the other 99 sheep. In the parable of the lost coin, a woman who has 10 silver coins lost one. It didn't run away. Money can't do that. She simply forgot where she put it last. She lit a lamp and swept the whole floor, possibly several times, until she finds the coin and it's back in her possession. In the parable of the prodigal son, the man had two sons. He gave them both the money they should receive after he passes, but the um, younger one requested, you know, could I have the money now? The youngest son then leaves home, spends all of the money he had, and doesn't live quite the way his father raised him to be. He then decided to return home and beg his father to take him, not as his son, but as a servant. In all three parables, the one who was returned uh, what they thought they lost all celebrated. In the lost sheep, after the sheep wanders away to be found by the shepherd to be brought back, Jesus says, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. For the woman who found the coin she had lost, Jesus said, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. As for the prodigal son, after the older son was a little upset to learn of the celebration the father is having for the return of his son, who before chose to leave while you know the older son stayed and served his father for those many years, the father says to um, his older son, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive for he was lost and is found. You know, we all struggle with our faith sometimes. I'm sure even Pastor Chris has his moments of doubt as certain events um, unfold in our world. If you ever find yourself too far away, whether you wandered off, got a little lost, or even chose to walk away, remember that as long as you're here on earth, breathing that breath God has given you, it is never too late to repent and come back to the one who loves you the most, to be thrown back into that fire, to become a light for all the world to see. Let's pray. Lord, we understand that there are and will be problems in our lives, but please remind us of your presence when these problems seem too big to fix. We want to believe that you know best. We hope to remain patient as we search for purpose. And all the God's children say, Stay by.
by my cradle till morning is nigh. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care and fit us for heaven to live In this time, we enter into a time of prayer. If you are joining us online on Zoom or on Facebook, you can in the comments section share with us your joys and concerns. We always want to be in prayer with you, not just in this time, but in all times. Uh, we certainly uh, want to remember uh, Pastor Brad as he uh, shares his last message with us here at Hammond and as he begins a new adventure. Uh, we are uh, definitely going to lift him up uh, in our prayers there. Uh, we want to continue to lift up uh, Jenny Beza and Roger Collier and Kathy Clark and Don and Joanne Harris, Sandy Kisman, Jerry Kulinowski, Cameron Little and Bernie Newell, Alan Pewillar, Logan Polich, John Reed, Jane Shower, Amanda Cerna, Henry and Pat Showers, Nancy and John Steele, uh, my beautiful Ella, Cheryl Walters, the South Holland Fire Department and the family of Dylan Cunningham, our homebound, the Del Goyers, Jim Mowry and Burl Puckering. Uh, in this time again, we uh, uh, want to lift up uh, Lessa Shearing, uh, Harriet Smith suffering from uh, a COVID. Uh, we want to lift Harriet up in our prayers. And I would just like to take a moment to uh, thank all of the wonderful staff and uh, volunteer leaders that we have here at First UMC of Hammond. In my first six months here, I have seen some amazing people make some amazing accommodations in a, an incredible time uh, to welcome a family to lead their parish. And I cannot stress to you enough how grateful I, I am for uh, the, the folks uh, in this room, Kathy and Sarah and, and Brad. It's been, an, it's been really an honor to be able to undergo this with uh, such a, a fine student and a fine young pastor and uh, someone who I just happen to consider a very dear friend. Um, and so just, I, if you're out there, uh, folks, uh, Mike, uh, thank you so much for the messages that you bring. We, uh, there's so many people, and Brenda, I'm going to forget folks, but uh, I just wanted to ensure and, and let all of you know how wonderfully appreciative I am for all of uh, your work that you put in, in God's service uh, here at first. Uh, we're prayers for... Uh, Daughter-in-law's father, Don, Deb, uh, Deb Pitts Olson is asking, uh, Debbie Pitts Olson is asking, uh, there's cancer uh, that he is battling. Uh, Josie, of course, uh, her brother, cousins, and uh, her sister-in-law, we want to continue to lift uh, them up as well. Uh, continue in Zoom. Are there any in Zoom? Is anyone on? Right. Okay. Yeah, so we have a couple on Zoom. We, Pat Mosley is asking prayers for Victoria, her grandson's friend who is healing from a surgery. Um, Molly Bodie's brother-in-law who is struggling with COVID. We continue prayers for Helen O'Mara who is recovering in rehab. 
Um, and then prayers for Dave Hinchell as he was hospitalized yesterday morning. So I'm um, also keeping Mary in prayers. Um, Sue is asking prayers for Zachary Daly, who is recovering from surgery. And um, Sandy is asking for prayers for her cousin. Um, oh, that's just from Sam, sorry, um, for his cousin, Julissa. Julissa. And, 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 and we have to Grandma. pray that people will begin to help you out, Sammy. Yes, we will lift uh, all those in our prayers. We uh, want to ask, uh, continue as you're watching, not just now, uh, but uh, uh, as you catch later on, uh, continue to share with us your joys and concerns. In this time, let me invite you uh, to quiet your minds and hearts and go with me before God in prayer. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, who so many centuries ago decided that there was going to be one person. There was going to be one being to be the final bridge of reconciliation between God and humanity. And that person came in the form of the Christ child, whom we continue to celebrate this day whom we continue to hope in, who we continue to find joy in. And in this time, continue to be grateful to you, O oh God, for sending this most amazing gift. Father, as we continue through the holiday season and as families continue to gather as safely as possible, we hope there are those who continue to struggle. We celebrated worship in the parking lot on Christmas Eve. Some in the warmth of our cars some with half-warm bums and frozen faces, but we gathered and we celebrated the coming King. And yet there were some for whom the cold was a reminder of how little they have, how exposed they are, and how close they are to having literally nothing. And in so many ways, that is the case for so many people in so many different ways. Father, we bring those people before you this day. We have mentioned many. There are those known only to you. Father, as we end one year and look with hope towards another, we pray that you would mold us from this point forward, that you would make our hearts, our minds, our spirits to be reflective of you in everything that we do so that we may be the instruments of your healing, the instruments of your peace, bringing the good news of hope and joy and peace and love to the whole world. Father, where there is pain, bring comfort. Where there is a broken heart, mend it. Where there are broken relationships, In the spirit of your peace, mend those fences. Father, and there are those requests, 
issues, problems, concerns that go unmentioned and in some ways are just as difficult to overcome, as hard to face as anything that we could bring forth from our mouths. Father, for those we pray especially this day. Now, Father, I ask that you be with us as we pray that prayer Jesus taught us, as he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture reading for this morning comes from the epistle to the Galatians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. I will be reading from the Common English Bible. But when the fulfillment of the time came, God sent his son, born through a woman and under the law, This was so that he could redeem those under the law so that we could be adopted. Because you are sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son or daughter. And you are, if you are his child, then you are also an heir through God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, bless these words that come out of my mouth. May it touch the hearts and souls of those that are listening. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It usually begins on Thanksgiving Day or maybe a few days beforehand, and it makes certain that for me the season of perpetual hope has entered. It's the time of year when my sister-in-law starts asking me that dreaded question, what do you want for Christmas? My least favorite question of all time, I never know really what to say while there are many things in this world that I want. Most cannot be wrapped in brightly colored paper and tied with a bow. I often try as long as I can to avoid giving an answer, but most years I get cornered and forced to relinquish a few ideas of what I want for Christmas. This dance is a dance that my sister-in-law and I have been playing for many years. And a few years ago, my sister joined in and started asking me that same dreaded question. Well, some years I try to be a little funny and it comes back to bite me. One year I asked for a pony for Christmas and I got a stuffed pony. And of course that pony needed a friend so I also got a stuffed gorilla for Christmas that year. That following year, after the fifth or sixth time of my sister-in-law asking me that question um, and after I had consumed maybe a glass or two of wine and was watching National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation with my friends, I responded with, and you guessed it, a dicky for Christmas. You know, that turtleneck that Cousin Eddie wears under his white sweater. And when it came time to opening presents, I got not one, but four dickies, all different colors for Christmas. Throughout the day, we thought it would be funny for me to change those dickies underneath a white sweater, much like Cousin Eddie wore. And it was only my cousin's husband, Tony, that caught on and said, why do you keep changing your shirt, Brad? And so we told them the story. Well, those dickies made their way into the bottom drawer of my dresser until one year I was cleaning things out in the spring and decided to give them or sell them in our family's garage sale. And much to my surprise, they sold But much to my chagrin, I received them again that Christmas from my sister-in-law. Those dickies have not disappeared. We have passed them back and forth. One year, I had them sewn into a pillow, 
hoping that that would be the end of it. It wasn't. She took them apart, and I received them the following year. Well, last year, I gave them to my nephews, hoping they fell in love with them. We'll see. We're doing our family gift exchange tomorrow. I'll let you know if I get those Dickies back. Those Dickies are certainly the gifts that keep on giving. For most, Christmas is like God turning the light switch on in a dark room. God's gift to the world was a son born and wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. But for Jesus, as those nails were being driven into his hands and feet, and he was being lifted onto the cross, that's when Jesus was saying, Merry Christmas to you and me. The gift that Jesus gave us wasn't wrapped in paper and put under a tree. It was covered in blood and hung on one. Instead of a ribbon, there were nails, and instead of a bow, there was a crown of thorns. That's what we celebrated a few days ago, the greatest gift ever given. God became flesh in Jesus, but the real gift that humanity was given came when the Lamb of God was laying on the timbers, when nails were driven into his hands and feet, and blood poured from his body, wholly redeeming humanity from slavery to sin. That redemption not only paid for our freedom from slavery, but it also granted us the opportunity to be fully adopted into a community of faith in communion with God. And because of that, the Apostle Paul says that we are now no longer slaves, but sons and daughters. We are children of God. A one-year subscription to the Jelly of the Month Club might be a gift that gives you round, but to be a child of God, that's indescribable. To be, a, to be in Christ means that we are forgiven. It means that we can stand before God justified and righteous and holy because we are the righteousness of God, because we are in Christ. It means that we have eternal life and that we are an heir to all of the promises of God. It means the Lord Jesus comes again when the Lord Jesus comes again, we will meet him in the air and we will meet him forever and ever. And it means that we are no longer in darkness, stumbling around, thinking wrongly, hiding from God, living in slavery to sin and shame. We've been set free. The light of Christ shines all around us. It shines upon us, it shines in us, and it shines through us. The point of this all religions, philosophies, and tales, uh, rules of practices and guidelines or codes of conduct that adherents are expected to follow. It makes little difference to Paul whether said religion or philosophy is Judaism or some other tradition. The principal claim in verse 5 that Pastor Chris read is that all believers, both Paul and the Christians in Galatia, have been adopted as God's children. They were God's children, not because they followed a law, but because of their relationship to Christ and their status as heirs to the kingdom. Paul says earlier in chapter 3 that all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now if you belong to Christ, then indeed you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. However, God's redemptive endeavor is not limited to the past, to what he did when he sent his son. Whether Jew or Greek or slave or free or both male and female, all of these in individuals also experience redemption through the Spirit. As Paul previously indicated, God continues to act so that what was promised through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But Paul's point is unmistakable. Both he and the disciples in Galatia were God's children, whether by Jesus' faith or by their faith in him or perhaps both. With absolute conviction, Paul is able to declare, because you are sons and daughters, God has sent the Spirit of God's Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. According to Paul, God has redeemed us from slavery and adopted us as his children. God graciously made us heirs when God sent his Son into the world 
and sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Anyone who is able to cry out, Abba, Father, knows that he or she is no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. Paul's point in his letter to the Galatians is clear. God has adopted all who believe as children by sending God's Son and the Spirit of God's Son. And because of that, they are no longer slaves, but heirs who all own the property in the entire kingdom. These verses show categorically that for Paul, the issue of how Jesus was conceived and born was not as important as the fact that Jesus was born to save. The stress is not on the supernatural birth of Jesus, but on the very natural process of being born of a woman. Jesus is not some celestial God who is above the law. He is fully human, who was born under the law as a Jew. Jesus came not to provide a new moral law or philosophy. He came with a specific function of freeing slaves and spreading the boundary of family to include the Gentiles. He came to break the chains that have bound humanity to sin to that point and in the future to come. And God through Christ Jesus came in full human form to comfort and care for humanity as we traverse this newly found freedom and adoption into a brand new community of faith. Have you ever entered a new situation not quite knowing what to expect or knowing a single person where you were going? Kind of like the first day in a new school or the first day in a new job. The first day for most is usually filled with anxiety, stress, maybe a little fear. My first day in sixth grade, in my memory, was the first, my worst first day of school ever. It was terrible. I was in a new school with new people and a new way of doing school. There was less structure and more freedom. For those that know me, you know that scares me. I like structure. Right, Chris? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's okay. I was so stressed and anxious that I made myself sick and miserable. The next day was a little better, and the day after that was better than the second. Eventually, life got easier, and I made a few new friends and got to know my teachers. I found my place in that community. I was welcomed into a new group of friends along with some old ones. There was a sense of freedom in middle school that we didn't have in elementary school. The teachers trusted us to get from point A to point B without supervision. Imagine, if you will, you are a Galatian in the days after Christ was crucified and you received this letter from a man named Paul, who was telling you that the man that was nailed to a tree was God made flesh, who was born from another human being and who was sent to pay for your freedom from slavery and welcome you into a new community filled with the light of God and with people you don't know many of whom probably pushed you to the margins through oppression. And not only are you now part of this community in communion with God, but this guy is also telling you that like the rest of the people in this community, you are an heir to the entire kingdom that God created. I don't know about you, but this would scare me. It would scare me because it sounds too good to be true. I would ask myself, am I being punked? Is this a trick? It would, cause me the, it would cause the anxiety and stress to start bubbling up within me. It would scare me so much that I would cry out, Abba, Father. I can imagine standing there, crying out to our creator when I feel a sense of warmth wash over me from my head to my toes as the light of God fills my soul and then feeling the physical presence of someone's arm wrapping around my shoulders. When I turn and see a face of a stranger, who would soon become a companion in ministry, answering the call from God to live my life the way Christ lived his. Immediately, that fear and anxiety would disappear as we realize that we are safe and secure in our new community and we have nothing more to fear. That feeling and warmth and peace has been felt by Christians millions of times since Paul wrote this letter and will be felt by millions of Christians to come. Our job as Christians, already freed and welcomed into this community of faith, 
is to be there to comfort and care for the newly freed and formed Christians, something that I know all of you are already great at. Four months ago, I walked through the doors off the East parking lot for the first time into a new community of faith that would quickly become part of my church family. I know that it's been hard to form relationships in this virtual world that we live in, but each of you have managed to welcome me warmly into your church family and have comforted me and cared for me as I have found my way and my place in the first UMC of Hammond family. Although our time together was short and I still have not, many of you, not met many of you in person, I am grateful for your warm embrace and for the care that I have experienced over the past few months. You've adopted me into your hearts and welcomed me into your homes every week for the past four months much in the same way that God adopted each of us fully into the kingdom of God with the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ Jesus. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you for your love. Each of you will forever be a part of my own community, and I will continue to keep you in my prayers as you continue to grow closer to God. And I ask that you continue to keep me in yours as I embark on my journey of ministry with God. God sent his son to redeem us from life of sin so that we could be adopted into a full communion with God through Christ and into the whole community of faith. Even though this is goodbye, we will continue to work together to fulfill that call from Christ Jesus to go and do likewise. Amen. There's a song in the air, there's a star in the sky, there's a mother's deep prayer and a baby's low cry, and the star rains its fire while the beautiful sing for the manger of Bethlehem cradles a king. There's a tumult of joy or the wonderful birth for the virgin sweet boy is the Lord of the earth. I the star rains its fire while the beautiful sing for the manger of Bethlehem cradles a king. We rejoice in the light and we echo the song that comes down through the night from the heavenly throng. I we shout to the lovely evangel they bring and we greet in his cradle our Savior and King. I needed was no longer in that hymnal, sorry. In this time now, we prepare to receive the Eucharist, the uh, means of grace that John Wesley talked about. We, we view Holy Communion in the Methodist tradition in a broad sense, meaning that we believe God's grace is so present in this act that it is of a salvific nature. That's a really uh, a word that, did you learn that in seminary? Yeah. Salvific, okay. I, well, he went to Garrett, the fancy schmancy United Methodist Seminary. I went to lowly United, but uh, uh, it, the salvific nature of communion is that once one comes with a heart desirous of God, a heart desirous to be transformed by God, that is all that is necessary for the means of grace available to us to take effect. And so we invite all to come. Whether you are a believer or you are yet to become one, all are welcome at Christ's table. 
On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he uh, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts of, uh, in your son, Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Now join me as we come together and sing our closing hymn. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives, but greater still, the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross the river, I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Now, as 
you leave this place today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you all and give you peace. Amen. Now, before you leave, just before you hit that leave meeting button or exit out of Facebook, I do have uh, a couple of things to share with you. First, we do have a special video we have prepared uh, for our Christmas Eve service. Uh, we pre-recorded parts of it, and uh, unfortunately, the only person we have to show the stuff that didn't make it to air uh, is Brad, and so here are some of his bloopers from Christmas Eve. <laughs> Welcome. Are you centered after that? Okay, good. <laughs> no, I wish I I wish you were joking, but I know you. silence and everybody's staring at me. I did. Do you want me to redo that? Joy-ish? It's kind of it's kind of a joyous news. Ish. Sarah's not enjoying this as much as you and I are. <laughs> no, I can't see you, that's true. Okay. So after this, it's done. So there's nothing else. Brad back up to his uh, special spot for just a second. Yeah. Um, you see, I have in my hands a robe. Um, this robe is a, it was a, a let's see, it, it was $75. I got it on clearance at Cokesbury at annual conference one year. I did not have a robe. My, my, the only robe that I had was one that came up to my knees and that is a no-no for clerical robes. And so I had no choice but to get what I could afford. And it was this gold one that uh, I was commissioned in. And I was the only one with a gold robe to be commissioned in. Uh, some might think that there was some Freudian reason that I wanted to stand out. Uh, I'm sorry, don't laugh, don't laugh at that. <laughs> Don't laugh at that. Uh, but uh, I've got sort of a white elephant gift for Brad uh, today, and that is this robe. I promised him that before he left, he was going to have to preach in this. That didn't happen, and I wasn't going to make, it, make him do that this morning. But uh, I wanted to uh, give Brad this robe, and it's really sort of perfect because it, it is a great white elephant gift. Yes. But uh, like a white elephant gift it uh, may not look like much or it may look like too much then uh, this does definitely look like too much but uh, it is not what it looked like like ministry like you thought ministry was going to be when you entered it it's not what you thought it would look like but in my estimation it has been fantastic getting to work with like I said uh, an amazing uh, young uh, pastor and uh, a very dear friend, uh, 
to me. And I know that he's going to be able to do some amazing things in something that he didn't quite know what it was going to be like, fit like, look like. But I have every confidence that uh, he will, by the grace of God, do some amazing things in it. Uh, along with it, these, there are some uh, stoles in here. I was bequeathed these from a former executive to the bishop, uh, Bishop Woody White, upon his retirement. And uh, so I am giving these to Brad. The, the stoles, they say that the ordained are only supposed to wear those. And, and he's got a few years before that. However, the, and this is the last thing I'll say, uh, the clerical robe is not something that you wear to be audacious or to be bold. The clerical robe is something that is to, that is to steal away your identity so that the people see you, so that the people see Christ. And even though this is the loudest clerical robe on planet Earth, um, it will do nothing but help Brad disappear so that he can share the message of God with the people of Clay City and Bowling Green. I'm so Bowling Green. I knew that. Uh, so I'm going to give this to him uh, later, uh, but uh, I just wanted to, uh, him to have it on camera just because so, I know he's sort of uncomfortable right now, but just no, a just, just a little, but yeah. uh, uh, that is, and that's my, as, as a mentor, that's one of the things that I get to. But uh, I just want to uh, thank you for all of the service that you gave us in this strange, awkward, not normal time. Um, but again, I know you're going to do amazing things by God's grace. Thank you, thank you Brad. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Have a wonderful day.